Subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscription button below. For future webinars and online short courses, please visit our website at australianwaterschool.com.au. Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar from uh, the Australian Water School on simplifying water markets. It's terrific to have our presenters today from Mars and Jacob Associates, Simo Tavonen and Jeremy Cheesman. It's going to be a really interesting uh, webinar today. I'm Ian Reid. I'm the Chief Academic Officer here at IceForum and IceForum is the uh, first sponsor behind the Australian Water School. Just to let you know also about other training events coming up. We offer these free webinars regularly as you see. You can see the uh, uh, three uh, next webinars coming up on the varied topics and also I'd like to mention our online courses are uh, becoming incredibly popular these courses particularly in the modeling area so dam breach modeling and uh, aircraft modeling and also now uh, groundwater modeling a new course which has been incredibly successful our presenters today are two very experienced water people in uh, in water markets uh, simo as you can see has uh, done a lot of work in the uh, in water markets policy and trade protocols welcome simo and you're working with government authorities and also with the private sector has been outstanding. And yeah. Jeremy's a uh, director of Mars and Jacob and uh, has a long experience with the, the Australian environment, in the US and in Southeast Asia, looking at uh, uh, water markets in particular. And uh, both are the, the driving force behind the water flow platform, which you'll hear uh, us talk about today. And uh, Person you can't see, Trevor Pillar is our normal presenter, normal uh, chair of this. Uh, Trevor's actually at the Groundwater Conference, but Trevor, welcome. But well, we understand you may not be able to uh, to chair, so uh, that's terrific. We're, we we look forward to hearing you next next time. Uh, so thanks for filling in the poll and just let you know who our audience is today. Uh, Forty percent from government. That's interesting, and quite a number of analysts. So we're looking, expecting some uh, some uh, very uh, tricky questions. Hopefully, some uh, good uh, uh, thoughtful questions will be very useful. Look forward to those. And uh, uh, most people are not yet trading in water. 70% uh, are involved with trade, and uh, but uh, a large number uh, would like to trade in the future. 37% of people want to trade, and maybe others are uh, probably helping those who are wanting to trade. So uh, uh, thanks for filling it in. Give us a good a sense of uh, who you are and who our audience is. So without uh, further ado, um, Welcome again. Thank you to our presenters and uh, Simo, we'll start with you. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. Uh, uh, Ice Forum and the Australian Water School for the opportunity to, to present today. Uh, really appreciate that. So Jeremy and I, we're going to go through a broad range of topics. So just a bit of an uh, outline for the webinar. We'll start off with some one-on-one -on -one stuff about market basics. Just acknowledging those in the audience who are new to water markets. But I'm going to keep that fairly brief, but if you have any questions regarding the basics, uh, please use the Q&A function and discuss it at the end of the webinar. Then uh, a few words about the complexities in the water market, and then uh, we're going to have a live demonstration of our water flow app, which we're really proud of. And, and then at the end, we're going to dust off the old crystal ball and have a look into the future, what's going to happen uh, in 2020 in the allocation in, in current markets. To kick off things with, water markets in some shape or form, they do exist acro across the globe, but Australia has by far the most sophisticated uh, water markets. And this is a result of, of decades of, of water policy and water reform to establish the underlying structures to support water markets. And water markets are a key mechanism by which Australia manages uh, the scarce resource that water is here, while still, still supporting economic growth. And it's based on a cap and trade market, where basically a cap for diversions has been established. So some water has been set aside for the environment and critical human needs, but then all the other uh, user types, of which agriculture is the, the biggest one, uh, they basically compete from the same uh, consumptive pool and the resources within that pool. And the cap and trade system, it incentivizes uh, participants to use markets because the, really the only way to get access to more water is to use the market and buy from, from someone else. And then Economics 101 would dictate that water is therefore bound to uh, flow to its highest value use, uh, supporting Australia's economy. 
So within that consumptive pool, uh, individual participants uh, are provided with uh, entitlements, which are their share of, of the total pool. And uh, so basically a water license, which has two main components, uh, the water access entitlement, which is your ongoing right to access uh, a share of water from a, from a specified resource. So it can be to a surface water uh, source, i.e. rivers, creeks, etc., or groundwater, which refers to water under the ground in the aquifers. Uh, and basically a good, good uh, metaphor for the entitlement, it's like a bucket. So that's your bucket, which, which uh, gives you an ongoing access to a water resource. And then the other component, water allocation, that's the actual water in your bucket, uh, which fills depending on, on the seasonal conditions and how much water is in storage is, year on year you may get a different amount of allocation to your entitlement. And both of these components are tradable, so they are separate assets to land titles in, in most Australian water markets. So you can trade them uh, uh, separately or, or together. So the transfer of an entitlement uh, is uh, something called a permanent trade, so it's like a any other uh, transfer of an asset, say you sell your house or land or whatever, with the exception that you don't have to sell a whole license at once, you can share a proportion of that. And then temporary trade refers to uh, trading uh, the allocation uh, on an annual basis. So uh, it's specific for an irrigation season, which is the same as financial year in Australia. So in, in most uh, systems it's from July to June. And these are the main or primary water trade products in the market. Uh, secondary products that utilize the characteristics of entitlements and allocations have been developed over the last decade uh, and their popularity is, is, is growing. So we're talking about products like forwards and, and, and leases and carryover parking. So not all uh, entitlements are the same. They have different characteristics, uh, and most importantly, uh, in terms of their reliability, which defines how much water you're likely to get to your bucket uh, year on year. So higher reliability entitlements, uh, they receive a full or very high allocation uh, on most years, even during very dry years, like this year in New South Wales, for instance, High security entitlements in Marambici and Mari have 97 and 95 percent allocation. Whereas lower reliability entitlements, they only receive allocation if there's enough water available in storage after high reliability allocations have been made. So, for instance, in New South Wales, general security entitlements in the Mari and Marambici have uh, 0 and 6 percent allocations. And obviously, the, these differences in reliability they are reflected on the trade values of these entitlements. So higher reliability entitlements are typically more expensive uh, in, in the water market. So water markets uh, in Australia, again, in some shape or form, exist in all states and territories. But by far the most active and liquid markets are located in the Murray-Darling Basin, uh, and specifically in the southern connected Murray-Darling Basin where water can be traded across uh, state boundaries of so Victoria, New South Wales, South Australia, in the uh, connected Murray uh, system, including uh, Murrumbidgee, Lower Darling, the Golden system. And as you can see, uh, in the last water year, more than 80% of all allocation trades were conducted in this connected system, and nearly half of, of the permanent trades as well. And 61% of, of all regulated service water entitlements in existence at the moment in Australia are located in, in these zones. Uh, trading rules. So obviously uh, water cannot be traded uh, between different sections or different uh, locations in Australia if they are not uh, hydrologically connected. So therefore the governments have established rules which determine uh, how water can be traded and between which areas, if any. 
And typically, I'm not going to go through this in, in great detail, but permanent water, it really cannot leave the, the source of origin. But temporary water can be traded between two uh, areas or two zones if they are connected hydrologically. But even then, trade limits may apply, which may mean that uh, uh, it can be a, a bit quite complex for participants to actually be aware of, of the trade opportunities at any one time. The size of, of the water market. So over the last 12 months in the Murray Darling Basin, uh, including both entitlement and allocation trades, more than $1 billion worth of water uh, has been traded, uh, nearly 20,000 transactions, and we estimate there are 30, maybe 40,000 uh, participants in the Murray Darling Basin. But as I said, uh, emerging markets do exist in, in outside of the MDB say Queensland, uh, Tasmania, uh, not so much in, in the NT or WA, but even there some good things are happening. And quickly about market drivers, so it's supply and demand. So the price uh, varies depending on supply and demand side drivers and uh, the price of water differs across regions, uh, types of water rights and time. But broadly, the, the key market drivers are the same everywhere. So availability broadly, uh, both long and short term, is just the strongest driver of water prices. But also commodity markets, uh, uh, investment in, in and, and changes in agriculture, they also have a, a big role determining the, determining the um, uh, current market price. And trading water, it, it does not come without risk, like all security and commodity markets risk is an inherent component. And there are different types of risks regarding uh, the allocation, the, so the, the board in your bucket you're gonna uh, receive year on year, but also some rules-based risks around credibility, around water spilling uh, due to account limits or spill events. And obviously a price risk is, is closely associated with water trading. And in order to, to mitigate risk, you need to, to know uh, many different things. So the, the, uh, the key feedback when we were first uh, starting the water flow project is that water markets are complex. It, it takes participants many hours just to get the basics right. And then, then you need to dig even deeper to actually be fully aware of all the complexities. So, you know, and many people are, are short on time, so therefore uh, they may not be incentivized to use watermarks. So in order to address these complexities and make watermarks more approachable by, by everybody, uh, our water flow application, it aims to reduce risk and improve market transparency. The, the objective being that with better understanding, participants are more confident and therefore in a better position to make well-informed trade decisions. But at this stage, I'm going to hand over to, to Jeremy, who's going to run through a live demo of our water flow app. Thanks very much, Simo. That's a terrific uh, introduction, and uh, it really sets the stage to see what uh, this app does. So I think you've uh, built up the expectations now. So Jeremy, you, it's your job now to, to meet them. So. Looking forward to the, the uh, demonstration of uh, what the app can do. Over to you. Thanks, Simo. Thanks, Ian. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, thanks very much to everyone for joining us today. So, my name is Jeremy. Um, I'm based out of Melbourne, and um, I'm one of the team behind the Waterflow product. It is to provide information um, easily to, to water market participants, to provide all of that information in one location. Um, to provide all of that information in one location and to, to make the information um, transparent to, to, to water users. So, first of all, what's important? The first uh, thing that's important is where to find water flow. So, waterflow, www.waterflow.io. Uh, when you um, log on to Waterflow for the first time, you uh, basically register for a free account. The majority of what we're providing through Waterflow is free. So the, the objective again is to increase transparency at low or no cost to water market participants. 
after you've registered for the free account, um, you choose a trading location. So where you're, um, you know, for example, where you're based or the market that you're most interested in and you register. After you've registered, you, it takes, there are a couple of things that um, Waterflow can do automatically for you. And I'll just take you through a couple of intro slides. The first thing is that um, you can see an overview of the markets. So Simo was talking previously around that there are temporary water markets or allocation water markets and products, and there's permanent water markets and um, permanent water products. So on the market overview, you can see for all of the different trade regions that Simo showed you on that map earlier on, you can see current prices. And if, for example, you want to find out where the Greater Goulburn location is, if you just click on that, um, click on that uh, little map icon, the map icon will show you, here's the Greater, greater Goulburn um, trading zone there, and it will show you the, the regions that it connects, that, that the zone connects into. So this really gives you, um, and we see a lot of users using this, they'll check in you know, daily or every couple of days and, and have a snapshot of um, where current water market prices are across the different regions. They'll also look at, for example, what the current permanent prices are, uh, and that is, of course, differentiated by high security and more high reliability and lower reliability products as well. But you can also get other uh, market over, over information. So, you know, for example, what are current storages and, and um, allocations? Again, you know, Simo was saying earlier on in, uh, in Victoria, you know, the uh, high security reliability of Goulburn is currently sitting at 61%. And you can also see connectivity. And I won't go into this in too much detail other than to say, as Simo introduced, uh, water markets are, many of the water markets are physically connected, but there are also different rules based on physical constraints and other types of constraints that mean that sometimes the gates between trade regions are open and other times they're shut. And so being able to have an understanding of uh, the status of those limits is really important. Now, not everybody uh, wants to um, wants to um, check the market all the time. So, one of the other neat things that you can do with Waterflow is that you can set up a um, you can set up notifications for trade limits. So, if IV to, in the Valley trade limits open or if they close, and you can also set up a, a alerts for price information. And when you set up these alerts, these will go to your mobile phone if you've provided them as an SMS, or they will go to your email where you've provided a um, where you've provided a, an email address. And to set up an alert, it's as simple as saying, "I would like to set up, let's say, a trade limit alert. Um, I'd like to know for Greater Goulburn if there's a trade limit to or from the zone. Notify me when it's open, and you save that save that um, notification." Sorry, I have to uh, change that up. Oh. Actually, I'll just I'll open one up and edit it. Um, but basically, you're allowed to. This is a, for example, a, a price a, a price trade, and this is just saying I'm interested in buying temporary water uh, at or below a price of four hundred dollars a meg in the Murrumbidgee. I don't care about my parcel size, and um, notify. And once that's been set up you'll get a message on your, uh, on your mobile phone or via email um, when that price, uh, when somebody um, lists a uh, parcel of water for less than $400 a meg. Um, so again, that allows you to, to, to manage your water uh, or manage what you're interested in. Um, intuitively, it's based on push information rather than you having to go in and look at the water flow site all the time. Another powerful feature of Waterflow is the buy and sell of, uh, of um, trading information. So the first point here is that Waterflow is not a water market trading platform. Waterflow is a water market information aggregation platform. So what we do is we bring together water market buy and sell information from a range of brokers and trading platforms. We put that in the one spot so that it makes it easy for you to access it. But we don't actually um, act as the uh, as, as the trading partner. Our role in the market is to introduce you to the to the the people looking to buy and sell water, not to actually conduct the trade for you. So, for example, if we want to sell up um, a water trade, I'll say for this example at the moment I'm sitting in one A Greater Goulburn. 
we'll say, let's say I want to buy um, 40, 40, uh, 4 meg of, um, megalitres of temporary water. I type in 4 meg. I hit search. And this search is now going out across um, all of our participating broker and water trade platform sites. And it's returning, what it returns here is a list of all of the available water in all of the regions where you can tra currently trade water. That is where there is currently not a, uh, an intervalley trade constraint in place. So for example, in the Greater Goulburn at the moment, we can trade water into the into, uh, Greater Goulburn from all of these trade regions. And this is one of the really powerful tools of water flow because it opens up to uh, water market participants and gives you a greater understanding of where you can actually source the water from. So let's say, for example, in the Greater Goulburn, I've, I've run the query, I've returned, and I can see all of these prices, 600, not the water price is currently 900 in, in Vic Murray below choke, and that's because the Murray to Goulburn uh, IVT is currently closed. But let's say, for example, that I say, okay, I want to buy water in the Greater Goulburn. I click on Greater Goulburn, and that actually then takes me through to the Greater Goulburn market. And what you can see here is that you'll see a price res representation. This shows basically the, how allocation prices have changed over the past 12 months. We get some background um, water information. You get information on the total cost of your trade. So this is the four megalitres of water plus your water authority fees so that you understand your full, full cost of trade. I'd note here that this excludes brokerage. Brokerage differs by broker, I and mean, we're working with brokers at the moment to see if we can get brokerage information into the platform. And then the other thing that you can see is in the Greater Goulburn, you can see the last 10 trades. And so this is really important for water market information. It shows you who's trading, the types of volumes that they're trading, and these are, you can see these are all trades for the, uh, for the last, 20, um, last 24 hours or 48 hours. I'd note here that what you see here in the last 10 trades is, it's the most recent trades from our data providers. It doesn't provide full data market coverage. It provides coverage of the brokers and platforms who are participating in the water flow site at this time. The other thing that you can see here is who's currently got listings in the Greater Goulburn market. So here you can see Waterpool, H2OX, Elders and National Water Brokers are all offering water in the market. And um, what you can do then, and I'll just click the first one off the rank, is you can see who's got water available and what prices. At that point, if you decide that you want to trade or if you want to inquire about these products, you click on the, uh, on the providers or the broker's site and that will take you across to that site and you make that trade through that market intermediary. So you can do that for buying and sell, selling water for temporary water, for permanent water, and you can also do um, forward, search for forward water, so um, markets for forwards if, uh, if you're interested in those products as well. Okay, so that's quite a powerful feature. Um, as I said, that, that information is drawing information from multiple broker and intermediary sites, putting it in one place in a standard format. And it, you know, all the feedback that we've had from market participants so far is that reduces their water market search times from you know, a minimum of sort of 20 minutes, if you know what you're doing, down to a couple of seconds um, for, the, uh, for the market providers that we're currently working with. The market providers that we currently have or the intermediaries currently participating directly in the site for transparency are Wilkes Water, Key Water, H2OX, Elders, Waterpool, and National Water Brokers. Some of these other water providers who don't have their own platforms actually trade through these platforms themselves. And that means we actually have a greater representation of brokers um, listed on the site than what you see uh, being listed um, in, the, in the trade history. The other point is that if you yourself or are sitting here and you're, you're a broker um, or a market intermediary and you're interested in participating in Waterflow, please give us a call. Waterflow is free. We don't charge anybody any, any fees to, to, to join. Um, and again, all we're interested in is supporting the, the, the Australian water market to make it more transparent for users. So if you would like to participate in Waterflow, please get in contact and, and we'll do everything we can to, uh, to make that happen. 
And probably the other point is, again, we'd just like to thank and acknowledge all of the water market intermediaries who are currently participating in the market. Water flow is supported by a bunch of other, other things that you can see in the left-hand menu. Um, one of them is Water University. We won't uh, go into this in too much detail, but you can see here that if you want to find out more around things like water markets, trade rules and limits, um, this is all contained in pretty much plain English in um, the Water U University section. So if you're new to water markets or if you want to find out more information about water markets, Water Markets 101 is a really quick and easy place to start. And again, this is all free. The other thing that water, water Flow does is it contains a series of reports and outlooks. And probably, and we source this information from the Bureau of Meteorology and from um, state um, government providers. And again, we, we thank um, those providers for providing all of this information to us. Again, this information is provided free. Uh, to water flow users and it's provided free to us. So in terms of reports and outlooks, again, all in the one place, rather than having to go to different sites to find it. You can find climate outlooks. So this is the Bureau of Meteorology's climate outlook. So you can understand uh, what's going to happen in terms of likely um, temperatures, rainfall. And you can also find um, uh, outlooks for uh, water allocation announcements. And so this, for example, is the Vic Murray Below Choke, um, Water Outlook for December and February, uh, based on whether it's wet, average, dry, or extremely dry. And again, what this tells you, if you're owning or looking at um, Vic Murray Below Choke water products, you can see this, look at these water products, and you can see how your allocations are potentially going to change depending on inflow conditions. The only other thing that I would say here in the interest of time is that uh, Waterflow does have what we call premium products. Um, these premium products are fee-based products, but we are developing them for a range of water market participants, in particular people like banks, intermediary um, evaluators, uh, governments are interested in using these Waterflow products. Some of the products that we have, for example, are uh, dashboards, interactive dashboards, so a dashboard brings together, for example, in the case of Murrumbidgee, uh, in this example, brings together all of a snapshot of the market in one spot. So temporary, permanent, your IVT status, and historical prices all in one, in one place. The other thing that we offer is um, a range of uh, value-added data products. Uh, Waterflow contains cleaned data for uh, prices, volumes, allocations, and a range of other things for the last 15 years or so. And um, water market participants, in particular, uh, larger participants are using this information to help them make informed um, water market um, transaction decisions. So that's about all I wanted to cover off. Uh, if the, uh, Again, we're, thanks very much, and we'll um, take it up with questions later on. Thanks, Jeremy. That's terrific. Uh, great demonstration. I think it really gives a good eye idea of what the app does. I've uh, got some questions coming in. Thank you for those. Please, uh, now's a great time to add your question to the Q&A uh, panel, if you wish. Uh, but there are a few we could ask now, but I'll, what I might do, I might go back to Simo just to uh, ask him to give us an update on the current market situation. I'm sure people are interested in that. And then uh, we can probably take all the questions in one hit. So thanks, Jeremy. And uh, back to you, Simo, for the current market trends. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Ian. Uh, so, uh, well, it's been you know, widely in the media that we are in, a, in the middle of jail and therefore water prices are, are high. And there are all sorts of uh, reviews and inquiries uh, going on at the moment to, to basically investigate the integrity of, of, of the water market and if, if uh, the market is actually uh, working as, as it should. Uh, but yeah, very, dry year, uh, low inflows, uh, and as a result, as you can see from this graph, uh, which is a, a longer term allocation market uh, trend report. So it has the, uh, the prices for select uh, 
systems across the basin, uh, four in the southern basin, one in, in the northern basin, and trade volumes since 2007. So basically the last time when, when temporary water uh, really, really across the basin saw prices above uh, $1,000 per megaliter was the millennium drought. So at the peak of that in, in late 2007, early uh, 2008, allocation prices in the Southern Connect system reached a peak of, of whatever individual trades at $1,500, just a handful, but even the monthly uh, average prices were above $1,000 per meg, as you can see here. But that peak was very short-lived, lasted at best eight weeks and then we got some rain, got some extra allocation, so it came down to uh, to three hundred dollars per meg uh, and it picked up again but never returned to uh, those peak numbers and basically ever since the drought broke uh, allocation prices were quite low and uh, but now over the last 24 months or so they've been on the rise again because inflows have been below average. So I suppose everybody wants to know where the prices are going to go uh, uh, in the future, especially in the near future. It's, it's not even summer yet and we've already seen prices above uh, $1,000 to megaliter in, in the Murray below show. Uh, but he also reminded that it's not just the southern basin where prices are high. In fact, the highest prices this, seen, this season for individual trades have been witnessed in, in the Macquarie uh, regulated river. Uh, the highest trade was done at $1,200, mega, uh, $35 uh, per megaliter. So, uh, and the whole of Northern Basin, the, the water availability situation is quite bleak. Many people have no access to surface water at all because their carryover, carryover volumes have been uh, restricted because there's not enough water in these storages to deliver that water. But nevertheless, uh, historically speaking, very high prices, uh, and it's not even summer yet. Uh, and typically, there's always going to be demand in the middle of the uh, peak irrigation times in, in, from December to, to February. And uh, I can't think of any reason why this wouldn't be the case this year as well. So unless we get some meaningful rain, uh, which will result in increased allocations and more supply to the market. Uh, I think, well, I'm pretty sure that we haven't seen the, the price peak of, of this year yet. It's, it's yet to come. So, uh, and yeah, that applies to the uh, Murray Below joke markets. Obviously there are restrictions between the Golden system and the Murray system and also the Murambici uh, system is cut off uh, at the moment. There may be sporadic access from Murambici I think the Golden IBT is likely to open at some states. Will it remain open to soften uh, prices to, to a great extent? Uh, I'm not sure about that. And then there's always the next season. So, uh, you know, if we're already seeing temporary water prices this high, uh, if we don't get inflows, I think next year it's, it's going to get real ugly, even uglier than this season. So, also, uh, looking historically, uh, this is a bit of a curve which, which uh, compares water availability. So water that's been allocated for entitlements in the Southern Basin, excluding water that's held by state and federal environmental water managers. And then uh, on the uh, y-axis, we have the annual volume weighted average price of the Southern Connected System. So we can see from here that thus far the all-time high annual average water price was at the time of, of, of the peak millennium drought or 708. So across all zones, so this aggregates all systems in the, in the Southern Connected system, the average price was around $600 per meg. And thus far in the Southern Basin, uh, the BVAP uh, for this season, it's already approaching $700. So Without rain, I think it's it's almost guaranteed that we're going to see new all-time high annual average price. Uh, and the modeled price, according to this curve, would 
be somewhere around that $700 mark. Uh, but again, this, this model, it's quite simplistic. It doesn't factor in carryover uh, and it's an annual average price. It's not really a good indicator of, of, uh, of, of the nuance, what happens in the market, but it, it's indicative of, of, of the uh, uh, impact of, of low uh, availability. And broadly, it, it implies that even though water prices are high, the moment availability, uh, when you exclude the environmental entitlements, uh, it, it's mm. really low. So therefore, the markets are broadly working as they should. And then some uh, information about the uh, permanent market. This is an aggregation of water prices across the southern uh, basin. So it aggregates all the high reliability and high security entitlements, uh, general security in New South Wales and low reliability in uh, in uh, Victoria. As you can see, basically ever since 2014, there's been an ongoing increase in the entitlement values. And that begs the question, well, how long can this go on? Uh, and yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, I would be inclined to say that as long as the, the dry spell continues, the uh, relative value of holding an allocation yielding high security entitlement uh, will just increase. So especially in New South Wales and in South Australia, uh, I think those values might still go up a bit. Victoria, a bit unsure. I mean, this season they're likely to get say 50% allocation in, in, in the Murray, maybe 60. Next year, 30%. You're buying high reliability water at $7,000 per megaliter. Does that stack up financially or even as a long-term investment? So, Unsure how much upside there still is with, with the Victorian high reliability. And I'd be really surprised to see the general security values appreciating to a great extent as long as it remains dry because they're going to yield bugger all allocation. So, and we've already seen the Murray market softening uh, for general security. So I think that trend is likely to continue. But I would also add that the volumes are quite thin if you, if you look at the trade volumes and compare to. Uh, five years ago, we were looking at a very thin market, so the supply is, is quite uh, thin. There's a lot of competition for that water, uh, not just irrigators, but also other stakeholders, investors. And also, you have to be, remember that the government has an ongoing uh, water recovery program. They're looking to recover 450 gigs of long-term cap yield water across the basin so, through infrastructure. So there will be demand from, from that angle as well. So interesting times, uh, but yeah, well, I said this four months ago, but, but I'm saying, saying it again, the increase in values, it just can't go on forever. Now, there are certain boundaries there, like crop types, the net, net margins, uh, most crop types probably have already been outpriced, uh, but some of the high value permanent horticulture crops still can sustain these high prices. And yeah, who knows, but uh, yeah, I would, Envisage that the high security entitlements in New South Wales and South Australia uh, might still go up a bit. And finally, looking at the inflows. So, availability it drives pretty much all water prices, temporary and, and permanent. But uh, looking at the River Murray total system inflow data from the MDBA over the last four years, so with the exception of, of the first half of 2016 17, which was really wet, so well above average inflows. Uh, ever since then, so now approaching three years in a row, uh, inflows have been well below average, both below the long-term average, but also below the 10-year uh, the, uh, average. So as I said, without meaningful inflows, the rel relative value of holding a higher security entitlement will continue to increase. Uh, and historically speaking, uh, if you look at the entitlement values, you need two consecutive wet years before entitlement prices start to decrease. Uh, so, uh, but we have to remember that the water markets in their current form are really young, We're talking about at best 15 years under current entitlement characteristics and market structures. So the only time a big wet really has happened was when the millennium drought broke. So between 2010 and 20. 
mid 2012, the inflows were high. And at, and at that time, the internal prices softened a fair bit, even though the Commonwealth was buying a lot of water for the environment. But that's really the only precedent. The only other time was that 2016-17 peak, which on an annual basis was, was a wet year, uh, and it sort of uh, plateaued the entire prices, but it, the prices didn't go down. So that's the latest precedent of, of, of the uh, uh, wet conditions not having an impact on the, on the water prices. But also I would add that we're completely on uncharted territory. Prices for entitlements have never been this high. We've never had a situation like this. So it's, you know, even though historically speaking, uh, it took two years, uh, wet years to soften prices after, after the millennium drought. What's gonna happen, what if next rains uh, now, and, and it will rain, and people tend to have short memories, but uh, I would still say that it's gonna take a longer wet period before we're gonna see the internal prices soften uh, dramatically. That's all I had in terms of the market outlook. Uh, thanks for your, your uh, time and then you're happy to take some Great. questions. Thanks, Simo, and um, thanks for um, the uh, update on the market. I think, as you said, everyone's really interested in that. And uh, thanks also to uh, Jeremy, who's been busy answering questions while Simo's been talking. So uh, we might run through some of those uh, uh, in a minute. But uh, there is one unanswered question at the moment uh, from Isa, who says, uh, uh, as a buyer, do you actually get what you pay for? That is, uh, who bears the conveyance costs uh, or the conveyance losses? So if you buy a megalitre of water, do you get a megalitre of water? Yeah, typically you do. So in the Baidang Basin, uh, conveyance losses are socialized. Uh, so the river operators uh, have conveyance water, uh, basically ensure that um, you get what you buy. There are a couple of exceptions in Queensland, like the Upper Condamine Water Supply Scheme, where between different uh, systems, uh, channel and river systems, there are exchange rates for temporary water. So you, let's say you trade from zone A to B, you might lose 25%, 15%. But there are actually fairly strict rules in the basin plan and the water trading rules that prohibit the use of exchange rates unless uh, the states can justify that they are required to address transmission losses, basically. So they are rare, but say in the Southern Connected system, yeah, there are no, no losses to, to the buyer. Great. Thank you. Um, Look, I might also run through some of the questions which uh, Jared's actually answered while you were uh, discussing that. Um, so uh, you can have a look at the answers on your Q&A panel uh, participants. Uh, I merely asked a question about uh, who the, uh, uh, what portion of the market brokers are currently on the platform and uh, Jeremy's listed those um, there for you. Uh, Jeremy, any more to say about uh, your answer there? No, I, I hope that's helpful. So we've listed yeah. uh, the current brokers. I think the second thing is to say that um, the level of co coverage that these brokers represent differs in, in different markets. And so um, in places like Murrumbidgee, we'll have very strong representation and in other markets, we might have less representation. So this is a partial, but I would argue very good view of the market in terms of um, starting to provide uh, multiple, bro multiple brokers in one platform. Um, the other thing that I would note there is um, they're all Australian Water Broker Association members. Mm -hmm. And the last thing is that we welcome any other brokers joining. Uh, so if you're an intermediary, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, it is free to participate. Um, and again, we're just interested in increase, increasing transparency. Great. Terrific. And also another one about uh, brokers was the, the question from ISA about uh, whether you can place your water trade with multiple brokers or not. And you said, yes, you can. Yes, that's right. So you can trade, um, you can place um, um, on multiple intermediary sites. And as I say there, there are, there are positives and negatives to being able to do that. Um, the, 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 um, and we know the ACCC is looking at that as an issue as part of their inquiry. Um, but yes, at this point, you're, you are allowed to place on multiple sites. Right. And um, Peter's question here, you also answered about uh, whether or not it's possible to report and use your, your data and your graphs, uh, print them out and so on. And again, uh, you're very happy about that as well. Yeah, thanks, Peter. If you're, uh, if you're still listening, um, more than happy. And if you've got any questions, uh, 
about exporting or getting data out, just um, just give us a hoy on the Waterflow email or um, Simo or my on on the emails at the front. I think of this presentation. Terrific, thank you. There's a couple of questions there in the uh, the chat line. If you want to put, add your question uh, to the uh, open section, there we can go through that. So uh, we've got a few coming in. So um, someone else has said uh, uh, not all ex ex except municipal water agencies would have entitlements to high security waters. Assuming that just wondering. How big is the volume available and who are these entitlement holders generally? What type of people are the entitlement holders? Are they farmers? Are they um, speculators or who are these people? Yeah, so it's a broad range. Uh, if you're looking for a water baron, the biggest water baron is the Commonwealth government. They are across the basin, they, they own about 26% of, of uh, regulated surface water rights. Uh, if you are referring to the, the uh, the alleged water barons, so investors who may or may not own land and water, or just water. They do own a proportion of, of the uh, consumptive pool. Uh, I think the media tends in these guys are getting, it's, it's way out of proportion. Uh, but if we think, talk about how much high reliability, high security water there is in existence still, excluding governments, uh, so the water health for the environment. Uh, we're looking at say 4,700 gigaliters of, of water, of which uh, these investors would hold, uh, and not a significant, well, it's, it's significant, but it's probably in the range of maybe two, 300 gigaliters uh, okay. across all of them. So Tripping. not enough to be market makers really, right. uh, unless, Something weird happens, sure. but yeah, broad, broad it's broad spectrum uh, governments, uh, irrigators of all sizes and backgrounds, um, utilities, um, industrial users, but, but predominantly it would be held by agriculture. Great, thank you. Um, now, Peter Addison asked a question about uh, quality, so we've seen lots of numbers about quantity. Uh, what about uh, polluted water? How, how does that would that be uh, change your uh, your trade? Jeremy, that's that's. I leave that with you. <laughs> that sounds like a handle. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's not really. Um, uh, well, as far as I know, it's not really a consideration in the sure. water market. Like there, there are some quality issues locally, like some of the um, uh, areas down in South Australia, the Angus Premier system and stuff like that. But it's not really part of. of the uh, trade considerations. So, trading as such, it, it assumes that all water is equal and, and that, that water is of sufficient I mean, quality. The closest that we get is the trade in um, EC credits, so salinity credits, um, and there is a market for that, but it's a separate market. So. Great, thank you. Uh, now, Adam Lott says that whether you have a position on uh, water hoarding as a driver of price, I guess really here you're just passing on information. You don't really have a, have a position, is that right? No, we, we, we do have an opinion, uh, but, uh, but, but uh, yeah, predominantly uh, water prices are driven by supply and demand. Uh, there, locally, you know, at times when, when water investors have had a lot of capital to deploy, they surely have contributed to, to, uh, to uh, prices firming up in the entitled market. Uh, especially during times when, when interest and demand from other sectors have, has been thin. So right. yeah, surely over the last 10 years, it has contributed to price increases, but it hasn't been the main contributor. And uh, thank you. Annika uh, says that uh, one in 10 owners of, uh, uh, of, of traders in water are going to foreign owners. Uh, do you keep a record of the person who uses your services? So would you know who, who, is, who it is that's using your services at the moment? No, the, there are two parts to that uh, answering yeah. that, question, um, Annika. The first, um, the, the first part is that water flow uh, is a water market intermediary. So we don't actually see the underlying trade. All we see is that the intermediary has, has made a trade through the trade history. Um, you can, of course, go into registers and, and find out um, um, through various ways um, who, the, who the trading parties are. 
So the, the short answer is no, we don't keep a record of um, underlying, underlying trades and whether they're foreign, foreign or, um, or local participants. Uh, the second part of it is that we keep a record of who's, um, of who's using the, the platform for our own purposes, but we don't, um, we don't use that for any market intelligence purpose. It's just to make sure that we've got, uh, we've got active users and we're keeping them happy. Great. And uh, Rachel's got a couple of questions here. Her first question is uh, how long the platform is going to be maintained for. And her second question is about uh, the jurisdiction, jurisdictional uh, perspective. Uh, does the platform provide or intend to provide in the future any advice on required approvals? So, for example, uh, um, whether the site would uh, uh, require approval in the future. Um, so I'm going to handball back to Simo for the second question, mate. But I think the uh, the short answer of how long are we going to um, maintain the platform? Um, our, our short answer is as long as it's useful for for market participants. Um, you know, at the moment there are a range of views around whether we should be moving to a single exchange or whether we should be keeping separate registries with different intermediaries and an aggregator of information such as ourselves. Um, we again, we don't really have a view. On that, our view at the moment is we just want to keep this running, and we want to keep get people using it to make your lives easier. Um, Great. Thank you. And uh, about the, uh, I think you probably answered the second part, the uh, and the first part. I think so. Uh, Sim, I think uh, that's right. You've you've answered both of those. Yeah. yeah well, regarding the, the site user pools and more broadly about related products that are tradable in the water market. So talking about delivery shares in the uh, irrigation mm -hmm. districts, uh, site use approval, in the, uh, SA, uh, annual use limit transfers in the high sales zones in, in, in Victoria. So we've looked into all of these, uh, but at the end of the day, we are an information aggregation platform. So we draw in data from various sources mm -hmm. and we are sort of constrained by the quality of, of the data that's available either through state water registers or private uh, sector, i.e. intermediaries. So at the moment, at the best data for any of those related products is tin. Uh, if this situation improves, sure, we're absolutely looking to, to add uh, products and related products to the service. And, but at this stage, it's probably the place where there would be information already on those and we can perhaps top that up is the Water University, uh, which has some information on, on all of those matters. Great, thank you. Uh, and now on to a question about uh, the Water Barons you mentioned earlier. Uh, Caroline's question is, uh, how are they uh, securing maintained availability for future production? I don't know if you can answer that or not, but uh, have a go. Um, I, might, so I might start off on the first part of this, this answer. Um, Look, the, the first is that um, the first point here is that um, if we refer to them as water barons, that, that a lot of the what we would call investors are currently um, have a water portfolio where they're in, entering into long term leases, um, and basically what that means is that they carry some of the risk for for production for producers in terms of providing water. So. Um, what we're seeing is not systematically a pattern of, um, of people holding water back from the market or um, availability, but they're, um, they're holding over water for, um, for future commitments to support irrigated production. And that allows them to smooth some of the ups and downs for irrigators. Um, Simo, do you have anything to add to that? No, perhaps just a general comment that uh, these investors uh, the only way they will make money with their water holdings is, is if someone at the end of the day uses that water to grow something. So it's not like they can just keep the water uh, to themselves. And well, it's, it's a very risky strategy uh, with, with all the rules and, uh, and uh, et cetera in place. So year on year, they will need to deploy that water to the market. So it's their incentive actually to support production and therefore uh, make a return on their investment. Great, thank you. And uh, now to Mark, we've got a couple of minutes left, so let's try and get through these questions if we can. Uh, if you could arrange for one underlying change to the rules or laws associated with water trading, what would you advise is needed to make water trading more efficient and valuable for society? 
Well, I, I might start, Jeremy. You, you can uh, add if you like. Well, like having gone through the last 24 months with the Waterflow project uh, and looking into the uh, barriers uh, in terms of market participation and activation, uh, I think a lot of the uh, perceived issues or, uh, would be fixed if, if the uh, market information would be more detailed and, and transparent. Now, I'm not talking about a situation where everybody's bought an account or balance would be fully disclosed in the public. I'm, I'm definitely not saying that. I'm, I'm not a supporter of that uh, agenda. But even talking about the ability of, of the public border information systems, registers, et cetera, to recognize and correctly display different border market products, say forwards and leases. Uh, so there's a limited amount of, of transparency for those products at best. The industry is, is doing whatever they can with their uh, websites and exchanges to provide transparency on this one. But it's really hard to ascertain what's the, the market share of, of the secondary products. So unless the underlying registers that capture that data are brought up to date, it's market participants, it's really hard to get proper visibility on, on how big these products are and, and therefore get perhaps get more confidence to, to look into other products and then hedge their own water risk. So I would, yeah, that, that's my answer. Continue to improve the yeah. information base. Terrific. Thank you. Look, I might just uh, move on and make, make one more, one last question. Um, Joe, we're not going to get to your question. It's, it's an interesting question about uh, uh, data about permanent planting. So maybe we can take that offline and uh, follow that up. Uh, but uh, maybe just one last from one plus seven who's asked, uh, how do you plan for temporary water as most of flows spill in flood? So at what dependability supply is planned in these two categories? Hmm. Jeremy? No, I'm just, I was just going to say that's a good, good question and similar is <laughs> this place to answer. Um, We've got good but, questions today. You know, there's probably two parts to that answer. One is um, how it impacts on reliability and the spill rules. But then the other one is how people can use carryover, different carryover products and, and lower security um, for carryover and, uh, and banking to manage risk. Great. Yeah, I'm not sure if I have much much to add on that. Uh, perhaps we can take that offline. Yeah. Sure. Well, thank you very much. Uh, our, our time has run out. Uh, I think you've, from the questions you've asked, and a number of people have uh, stayed online in our presentation, you can see that the uh, the uh, uh, presentations have been really useful, really engaging. So thank you very much, and thank you to our participants. A uh, further reminder about uh, the courses and the webinars coming up, and uh, also. Uh, when you leave the meeting, a feedback survey will come in. Please do fill in the survey. We do read the information. We would like to improve these as we go forward. And uh, you'll get a link in your email uh, to the YouTube video. Thanks to Jeremy and to Sumo and to all who attended. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye-bye for now. Thank you. Thanks. Subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscription button. For future webinars and online short courses, please visit our website at australianwaterschool.com.au